Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar this morning, um, the ISAT partnership webinar from nine, an introduction to the PDPA, what schools need to do to manage compliance. My name is Mark Orchison. Um, I'm this, uh, the founder and CEO of Nine. Um, joining me from the Nine side is Andrew Chung, who's a senior compliance consultant at Nine. And also at the end, we have Rob Parker from St Andrews, um, where we'll be going through some through some Q and A. Um, so the session agenda this morning is uh, I'm going to talk you through what compliance actually means. We're going to look at the differences between the PDPA um, versus the GDPR um, and, and talk about the overall management of, of, of compliance. We're going to start getting into the weeds a bit. So we're going to go through record of processing because that's like essentially the start of compliance. And then we've got Q&A with Andrew and, um, and Rob towards the end of the session. Now, if you have any questions through the course of uh, the webinar, then please put them in the questions bar. Um, we will be keeping an eye on those um, throughout the, uh, the webinar, um, and it's up to your opportunity to ask any questions as we are as we are going as we are going along. Um, in terms of the nine compliance program, um, we've been working with schools since um, early 2017 on um, on changes to to data protection law. And um, the uh, which has meant that, that over time we've managed to develop a, uh, a framework for for how uh, schools need to manage their compliance, and that's the nine privacy framework, which, which has nine core stages. Now we're not going to take you through each of those core stages um, today, um, but some of the sessions that we have um, uh, in, in the next few weeks link link off of this, and this is a downloadable resource. I would all also sent sent to you after after the session. Um, since working with scores in 2017 and, and building this framework, we've sort of developed a how-to. Um, and what you're going to see today, there's there's lots of things that you need to do to to, to, to manage compliance um, in terms of breadth and, and in terms of depth. And our expertise in education is to really make that journey for you less painful. Um, to to bring in resources and expertise from those many years of our own experience um, to ensure that um, uh, your compliance journey as is, uh, uh, as simple as possible. Now, being compliant with the PDPA in Thailand is very similar to uh, being compliant in in many other jurisdictions, and that's essentially having a plan for your compliance program. So, compliance at the very at the very heart of it is understanding the personal data that you collect and how you process that, who you share it with and, and, and how it's secured. And when I say process, um, the terminology of processing could be you're collecting personal data on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a form or you're collecting personal data through an information system or you're collecting personal data and it's being stored in a filing cabinet. That in itself is deemed processing. And when I refer to what's called a data controller, I'm referring to the school. So each of your schools under the terminology of the PDPA is called a data controller. And those people who you share personal data with are in many cases called a data processor. So the PDPA compliance essentially requires you as the data controller to understand all of the personal data that you collect. Um, have that recorded somewhere so you have a library of all your processing activities. You understand the risks associated with that, uh, that processing activity based upon the types of personal data and the demographic of uh, data subjects. And a data subject is a student, it's a member of staff, it's parents, and there'll be many other third parties that are also called data subjects. You understand the risk to them in terms of their rights and freedoms that are detailed within the PDAPA, given your um, uh, given given the risks, and that you then have a plan that is proportionate to your resources to mitigate and manage those risks. Um, and, and at its heart, that it that is compliance. So, if you look at the the, the date of the end end of June, and as many of you with the feedback that we've had, is that you're feeling overwhelmed with all the things that you need to get done by the the end of June. That's that's sort of like a mistruth. You know, what, what you actually required to have is a plan in place to manage the risks associated with the personal data that you collect. And the starting point to that is your, is your records of processing, or uh, which is typically the terminology that we use. But in the language of uh, the PDPA, it's called your data processing records. 
And then once you have that, that record of processing, you can then develop your policies and procedures that detail how you manage personal data within the school. And then you can put together a comprehensive training program. And in many cases, as a, as a school, you'll do training um, now before the end of the, the, the summer term and then perhaps in the new academic year. And then having that plan, having a plan that demonstrates how you are um, managing the, your, your obligations is compliance. And that plan never changes. It's an ongoing commitment to managing uh, data privacy um, and, and protection. I'm just got, there's a couple of questions here that are coming through. Oh, yeah. So uh, the presentation will be provided to you afterwards. And um, and the recording will also be available available for you. Um, so I wanted to wanted to sort of set a bit more context around um, the resources that you can get from Nine. So as the data protection law has changed around the world, and it started off in 2016 with the GDPR in Europe, which then came into law in May 2018. So, so the GDPR essentially it didn't necessarily change too much of previous previous data protection laws in Europe. In Europe, what it basically what it basically said was, okay, well, you now as an organisation, you now need to demonstrate through evidence how you are compliant with our laws. And if you can't demonstrate, then there is a there's a fine um, or any uh, other uh, dissuasive action such as um, uh, criminal procedures against individuals. So, so, so the GDPR didn't fundamentally change anything really that was in place prior to the GDPR. What it basically brought into the fact was, well, if, if, if you don't do these things, first of all, you need to evidence them. And if you don't do them, then there are penalties for you not, 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 not evidencing them. In, in, in Thailand, it's slightly different because essentially what's happened is that the PDPA has just come into play straight away. And the PDPA essentially reflects um, almost all aspects of the of the GDPR, although although there are sort of local nuances um, that, that 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 are slightly different, but the, the but the key concepts are are fundamentally the same. So all the work that we've done in terms of working with our schools in Europe, or working with our schools in Hong Kong, or 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 in 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 Singapore, where where the laws are also changing in Malaysia, um, in in Africa, in Brazil. All, all of those principles um, and all those learnings are essentially the same. So when we use the resources in one country, we can flip them over to, to another country because essentially there has been just a copy and paste to many, you know, I suppose for want of a better, better, better term, um, of the GDPR into local law. And, and this is demonstrated through, um, um, through these next three slides. And what you have is obviously you've got the GDPR on one side and you've got, well, where is this incorporated within the PDPA? So within, within Thailand, you have a regulator called the um, Personal Data Protection Committee who is responsible for overseeing compliance with the PDPA, but also enforcing fines um, or, uh, uh, or, or, or there, there, there is actually um, a criminal aspect where an individual can um, be placed into prison for, for, for up to one year for non-compliance. You have the same definitions, so the data controller, the school, wherever you see the term data controller, replace it with your, the name of your school. So in, in Rob's case, it's St Andrews is the data controller. Data processor is a third party who you as a school are sort of handing over the personal data that you've collected off of your staff and your, and, your, and, your, and, your, and, and your students and your parents, and you're handing it over to a third party to look after it to do a specific job for you. So if you think about your school information system, your management information system, um, um, essentially you are collecting personal data off of your staff and your students and then you are using uh, a third party system to do certain things with that data to enable you to manage the school. And, it, and, and those things are processing activities and the third party student information system provider, whether it be Sims, whether it be Veracross, or whether it be PowerSchool, uh, there's a whole host of different ones. They are essentially a, a data processor because they're only temporarily looking after that data on your behalf to do a job that you have outsourced to them. And it's your responsibility if you're giving something to someone else, it's your responsibility to ensure that there are re relevant protections in place in terms of how they handle the personal data in their IT system. So you need to have confidence that they have the relevant level of security protections to how they develop their code 
or how they host the the service for you because they're just babysitting on on your behalf and you ultimately have accountability to ensure that they have the relevant amounts of, uh, around us security now there's a, there's a good webinar if you've not watched it of one we did last week where we talk about um there's three of us uh, myself adam and we had a guest speaker from hampton school in the uk simi kindola and uh, where we talk about how we develop our app, which, which Andrews could take you through, and the security protections we put up through at every stage of the development cycle to give confidence to our clients that actually we take security seriously and we can evidence it. And if we can evidence it, our clients can evidence it, evidencing that. And, and the reason why you should watch that is it will give you the context and, of, of, of the things that you need to be knowing of um, or what you should be asking or being told of your suppliers. When we look at lawful lawful basis, um, so the process personal data, as a as a data controller in Thailand, you need to have a legal basis for doing so. Um, and these are the ones here. So you've got consent, performance of a contract, compliance with legal obligation, vital interests, task in the public interests, and legitimate interests. So on the left hand side, you've got the, the, the terms within the GDPR, and then the right hand side, you've got where they fit within the PDPA. And in most cases, as a school, you are processing personal data either because you are doing it to deliver the educational services contracts that um, you are being paid to deliver. Um, you have a legal obligation to do so um, for leg leg legitimate interests or in rare occasions where you actually require the consent of the of the data subject um, to process their personal data. And, 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 and these legal bases are quite important because they set the foundation for, um, for all your other obligations within uh, data protection law. And those things sit within your library of processing activities. So for example, if you're using images and photographs, you may require consent of the data subject to use those images and photographs. However, for the admissions process to evaluate a family or um, a child to be admitted in, into your school, that would be for the performance of a contract and not consent because they're seeking to be admitted into, into the school. And, 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 and the outcome of that could be a contract between the family and, and the school. And so you have to understand, first of all, the differences in, in the types of processing activities. And then consequently, uh, what is the most, most appropriate uh, uh, lawful basis uh, for that and, and, and the wider implications. Now, generally speaking, every school does the same things. You have an admissions, pro you have an, an admissions team, you have human resources, you have IT, you have finance, you have safeguarding and child protection, um, you have academic, you have ed tech, you know, the, the sort of the list, list goes on. So in each of those areas, you would hope there would be a single database that you could that you could refer to as a starting point to to map out the library of processing activities in your school. And with our app, that is something that we have done because because we know that if you start from scratch, it takes you three or four hundred man hours to do it from scratch. If you have if you, if you have nothing to do to map out all of those processing activities across the school. So within the um, records of processing feature within Nine App, there's a database that splits out by department the different records of processing, and then you can select it and use that as the base as the base build for your own library. And that's the biggest step for you in terms of um, your your road your road to um, your road to compliance. And Angie will take you through that um, um, uh, in a short while. Um, Data process and notification. So within the PDPA, you need to notify your data subjects, um, informing them of collection, um, the purpose of why you're capturing their, their personal data, your data retention, and then your rights. So if you think about the admissions process, before someone uh, starts the process of filling out the admissions form with the application for admission, there would be a statement there that basically says, we are collecting your personal data for the purpose of evaluating your family for admission. Um, uh, we will retain this data for X number of years. Um, and for further information, see our comprehensive privacy notice. And that can be found, that can be found here. Um, it may also say, if you are unsuccessful for admission, then, then we will delete this application after a, period, after a period of three years. So before the person, before the family goes and completes the admissions form, they understand, first of all, the purpose of the reasons why you're asking each of those indiv individual 
data fields. They understand and they can find out more about your overall approach to privacy because it has a link to your, your overall privacy notice. Um, and they understand that this admissions this admissions file is going to sort of be, 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 be stored by the school for, for a period of three years. When we look at then some other of the core principles of data protection law, when you're looking at that admissions form, you're then going, well, do we need to then you know, every every field that we need that we ask for, do we actually need that that field to um, evaluate that that family for admission? And that's what's called data minimization. But we'll touch upon that in in a second. So before you can before you can notify any data subjects, any members of staff, any students, any families about your privacy program. You sort of first of all need to know what you do, which data you collect in which areas, why you do it, what's your lawful basis. So you can do any of that notification before you uh, before you've actually um, uh, gone through that business analysis exercise. You can't do any training of your staff about how they handle personal data because you need to give them in real life examples of what you do as a school to give them the context about what their responsibilities are. So your record of processing is like the core starting block. Um, you can get a template policy, that's fine. You can get a template policy and say that's your privacy notice or that's your privacy policy or that's your information handling policy. But until it's tailored to your school, you're not demonstrating accountability because that's just a mythical policy that doesn't represent anything that's happening generally within your school. And you don't have any confidence about how that policy reflects what's going on with data and information within your school. Within the GDPR, there are issues around that, that there are requirements around data transfers, as there as there is within the PDPA. So, as a school, you need to understand if you collect personal data, where is it transferred to? Well, those examples that I've just given you, we know that from the admissions process, personal data is then transferred to a student information system, and that may be done through an upload in a browser, and then that data moves from the browser to a server in a different country because that's where the student information service or management information service provider is located. And that's a transfer outside of the territory of Thailand. And depending on where it's transferred to, um, there may be, there will be specific requirements in terms of um, whether uh, the Thai authorities deem that uh, the, the, the data on the server held in country X is actually compliant or, or offers the same level of standard of protection as, it, as, as, as if that data was, was held within, within Thailand. So if you think about all the different IT systems or the apps that all the apps on, on, the, on the tablet say that, that the kids use, um, all the apps across um, the entire school, um, you, may, you may be talking about hundreds of different pieces of technology where data is transferred to. You need to map out all those data transfers across the school. Now, I'm not saying you need to map it out to now in the end of June because that's that's entirely unrealistic. Um, what you need to do is you need to identify the the areas of highest risk and potential harm to your data to your data subjects, your staff, students, and parents. Should there be a loss of that personal data, and the areas there to really to consider are admissions, safeguarding, human resources, the student information, the student information system. And you, and you capture that all within your record of processing. So each of your processing activities, your application for admission may be linked with open apply as an admissions platform and a transfer takes place there. Data processing records, so this is your record of processing. Um, the first thing you do um, is not only required for you as a controller to evidencing your compliance, it's also required for the office of the PD, um, PDPC. And in some countries, um, each year, the school actually has to provide the uh, the PDPC equivalent with their record of processing to demonstrate that they are compliant. Now, I've not seen anything about that in Thailand, but that's something that, that they could enforce. You have what's called a data protection impact assessment. Now, in our app, the feature is called a DPIA. However, within the PDPA in Thailand, it's not that explicit. It doesn't say you need to do a data protection impact assessment where there's processing that's of a high risk. What it basically says is you need to determine the risks associated with each of your processing activities and apply appropriate security measures. Now, the only way you can do that is a risk assessment. So consequently, DPIA is all is there in all but, all but in name. The appointment of a data protection officer it, it, it is required where there are specific conditions that are met. Breach notification, you need to notify if you have a breach and do so within 72 hours. 
if there's a high risk, you have to notify data subjects. So the feature within our app allows you to determine whether the security incident that's taking place is actually a breach and whether it's a reportable breach, not only to the supervisory authority, but the data subjects. So it gives you the objectivity in managing your compliance program. Control of the processor contracts. So that is the score to third parties. And then you have these information rights. Um, so as, a, uh, as an individual, um, just thinking, just put yourself in your shoes outside of, uh, you know, oh, 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 there's an awful lot of work here to do in my role in the school. Think about yourself outside of school, go, right, well, you know, if you are handing over your personal data to a bank, you know, you want to know what's going to happen with that. So you have the right to be informed. Um, you have the, you know, if you, all, all the transactions that you, that take place associated with you through your credit card with the bank, you have the right to access that and you have the right to to to, to, to take that information back um, or move it to um, another bank. If information is incorrect, you have the right that to be rectified and you can ask for data to be erased. So all of these are individual rights that you as a school need to understand and then also need to be able to enact if someone requests you to do so. Um, which is a job in itself if you're not familiar with data privacy law to sort of understand each of those individual things. And when I talk about policies, here is an example of all the policies that, that you are likely to potentially need. And each of these policies needs to be tailored for your, for your school. So if you're looking at those, um, these are the policies that you get by subscribing to the app. Um, we don't tailor them for you, but you have access. You have access to them, and you can see that they are very education focused because we understand how data and information flow within the school. But you can only tailor these once you've done your record of processing, and then you can only train your staff and your policies once you've created your policies so that reflect your records of processing. So consequently, those are the three of the three points that you as a school need to put into play in in order to um, in order to uh, manage your compliance program. And when we come about training, it is not necessarily about, necessarily about listening to a webinar or um, or watching a presentation. Um, you need to think about the depth of training based upon the information that's being handled by every member of staff. So here, for example, we've got we do it at games based learning. So card games that you can play with different members of staff for them to understand the key concepts of data protection and also and also cybersecurity. Before I before I hand over to Andrew, we you know we've had obviously a significant uptake in terms of demand of our services given the changes within within Thailand. Um, now, within the ISAT offer, there is a number of hours of consultancy that, that were in addition to just buying the app. Uh, there is a sort of a war health warning here is that, is that depending on when you subscribe to the app or the rest of our services, we may not be able to provide those, um, those consultancy services for schools that, that sign up later in March just because we don't have people just sitting around waiting to do work. Um, so if you wanted to work with us, this is, this is like a, a, a warning. It may be that we have to push you back um, to starting with us um, in May or June or even the summer, um, uh, just to base what just based upon those demands. Um, so with that, I'm now going to hand over to Andrew. So um, Andrew, I'm going to stop sharing, and hopefully you can come online and uh, take over the screen. Hopefully, greetings everybody. Hope you can hear me. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, and then we can proceed from there. And whilst, whilst you're doing that, and just going to answer a couple of questions. Um, if a third party student information system company gets hacked, who is responsible for the breach of data? Would they be responsible to ensure? Okay, very good question. So first of all, you as a, so, so for, when it comes to hacking, um, there, there's only so much you can do. So um, as, a, as, a, as a software provider, right? Uh, and you can look at the webinar that, 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 that we showed last week. There's only so much you can do. And if you have a zero day exploit, which is one that's never been found before, you know, you can only re you can only react to that to that zero day exploit. And, and Microsoft had one with Exchange last last uh, last week. As the controller, it's your responsibility to ensure that the student information system provider has the right level of protections to manage the data within their system. So how do they build their code? How do they test the code? How often do they do pen testing? What evidence do they provide back to you as the, as the data controller 
that that they are babysitting your data in the right way. So just think about them as a babysitter. Are they locking the doors? Are they shutting the windows? Are they putting the stair gate on the stairs? Are they, when they're cooking, are they putting the boiling pan right at the back of the cooker rather than at the front? It's that sort of concept. Now, if you haven't done those checks, then you are ultimately responsible. If you have done those checks and there is a breach, the question is how thorough were your checks? And it, and it may be that, you're, that, you're, that, you're, that your uh, checks were entirely thorough and, and cyber breach was just an accident because accidents occur. And that's entirely fine. And data protection law across the world allows for accidents to, to take place. But it's whether you've done your due diligence in the first place. If you haven't done your due diligence, then yes, that's where you, you have a liability. And in Thailand, it's not just a commercial organizational liability. It's also an individual liability. So with that, with that Andrew, I'm going to put myself on mute and, um, and hand over to you. OK, thank you. Hope you can all hear me clearly. Uh, greetings. Welcome from uh, the UK. I'm going to show you how our app works. Now, there are other solutions available. This is the one that we use. And the purpose of this is just to show you how to do the records of processing. So our app actually does a lot of things, but we're just going to home in on the one thing that we talked about already, which is the record of processing. Now, to use it, there is a URL to go to, which is app.9.com. There is no software to download. There's no uh, installation of any sort. You just need an internet connection and a web browser, and you're in. And you can see I have the URL here. And I could log in at this point, and I would do ordinarily. But just for this test purposes, I'm actually going to use a different system here. So please ignore the URL at the top of the screen. I'm going to log in here to show you how it all works. Um, otherwise, everything looks identical um, to what it would be when you go in. Now, when you log in, there are a number of things we provide, news to keep you updated with what's going on in the world of data protection, more webinars and events, and in indeed recordings of past ones as well that you can look at. And we provide lots of training and videos and things to keep you informed, and you, you'll find these very useful. There are many more in the help section on the left-hand side. So as I mentioned, various components of this app, which I won't cover today, we're just going to go dive straight into the part of data privacy and protection and the record of processing. So in case he wasn't clear at all, this is a requirement in quite a number of jurisdictions around the world, increasingly so as well. This started in Europe some years ago. The idea of having a record of processing was so that you was so that you you initially in the old days informed the regulator of what kind of things you were doing with personal data. So as an organization, as a company, as a school or whatever um, your, your organization is, um, you'll be handling personal data, using it, storing it. And in the old days, you had to tell the regulator what it was. Um, since GDPR came in, things changed in Europe. And uh, the the, the idea of keeping an inventory instead of just telling the regulator every single time. Um, instead, you expect to keep an internal record. So the record of processing is an internal record, is an inventory of all the ways in which your organization is handling or processing personal data. So that's really where it all derives from. And you can keep a record of this on a spreadsheet if you wanted to or anything else. They just get really unwieldy at a time. So best practice in the industry really for any substantial organization is to use um, appropriate software. So we're going to show you how to do it in the Nine app. We're going to click on record of processing here. And on my test system here, you will see on the screen different parts of my imaginary school. These are all different areas. Uh, you can configure these however you like for your own school. So whether or not you choose to use these terms or whether you use lots more or fewer is entirely up to you. This, this whole system is configurable. You can create new ones. I'm simply going to go into one of these. Let's take admissions as an example and look into there just to give you some orientation of what's going on around the school. Each of these different processing areas has a person who is assigned as the owner who's responsible for looking after it. And each of those areas has members who also may help out in keeping it up to date. And that's a that's good practice in most schools that you have data owners who are responsible for a particular area they know very well, and they may have colleagues working in those areas who can also participate. And that incidentally is a little nudge in the direction of making sure that your records of processing involve people throughout your school. There is no way a data protection officer or any equivalent can possibly know of all the ways in which personal data is being handled in a school. It's a good idea to get people involved and to have um, people who have sufficient training throughout the school to understand that they not only need to record what's going on 
with personal data, but also to keep those records up to date. And this is the tool that they would use to log in and do that. So I'm going to show you how to do the rest of this now. I'm just going to click on edit on the site because I'm going to go into the admissions section and look at what we have. So once again, this is the section, there are owners identified, there are members. And in this example, I already have some examples of processing. You can see we have an application for admission, we have an emergency contact database, we have re-enrollment. These are all typical things you can find in admissions. And I'm going to show you how to populate this now. Um, this will be something of a whistle-stop tour, um, just so you know. Uh, when I do the kind of training and onboarding, I might spend an hour showing people how to do this. I've got about 15 minutes left right now, so this is a shorter one. So if this feels hurried, please don't feel it's going to be like that in reality. Um, we give a lot of support onboarding, uh, whatever's needed to help people get through this. Now, a couple of ways in which you can create processing records. You can either just start from scratch with a blank form, which uh, is with this button here, but we've actually built ready-made templates. We call these quick starts. Think of these as um, examples or templates that we've created in advance to make things quicker for you. And that's what I'm gonna do now. So I'm click on this quick start your processing form and up pops a little window. Which processing areas would you like to see examples for? And once again, lots of different types of areas here. These may or may not correspond exactly to the terms you use in your in your school, but of course you can see you can see easily what they what they pertain to. So you find something that's relevant to whatever it is you're looking at. I am in the admissions area, so I'm just going to get examples now for admissions. And so I'll click on that, select next. And here are lots more examples that I could use here that are relevant. Things to do with financial questionnaires and financial assistance or dealing with queries or visa and permit applications and so forth. I'll select the one at the bottom with, to do with withdrawal. You can see a description here of our template is to uh, deal with uh, someone choosing to leave the school. So I'll click on populate and that gives me the form down at the bottom here, withdrawal. This is ready to be used and when I've started using this it's going to join the other three at the top of the in the in the section above. So I'm going to edit this form now and proceed. So when you open it up, you get a page like this. There's quite a lot of text on this page. If I quickly scroll down, you'll see what we have here. There are actually three pages as well, um, but most of the information is on page one. So just giving you a, uh, a tour of this screen for now. At the top, we have the reference number. This is a term, this is a number you should ignore. You don't need to change that. All the other ones that are not grayed out, you can change. We have the name of the process activity here. This is withdrawal. Of course, you can change this as you wish. There are the, you, This is a template. You can change whatever you want. And the purpose is to designate someone as having left the school. And then what we provide on the section below is a description. Here we're asked to describe the complete end-to-end -end process. There's a paragraph of text here. This box is always about this size. If you started with a blank form, it would look identical to this. There just wouldn't be any words anywhere. And you would type in what's going on here. This is an opportunity for you to describe what's happening with the personal data. Um, it's not asking you for for names of individuals in your school. This is not going from a particular person to another. You don't need to name them. You can talk about them in terms of their job titles, but the, but the purpose of this is to understand where this begins. And it begins, of course, with a parent or guardian wishing to withdraw their school. And we talk about all the steps that might take place. Very likely with these templates, you'll need to edit them and change them. For example, you might not have a PDF of the withdrawal form, etc. Um, and you might, you know, there may not be email notifications sent to the finance department, etc. So you'll take this, edit it, and then you'll have your end-to-end -end process described. Following that, we answer the next question: who are the data subjects? Here we have opportunities to select different items. Now in the pre-selected template, let me just scroll down a bit more, we have parents and legal guardians and parents are selected which is why under the next question of what personal data is being processed you find parents and legal guardians. Similarly with children they're selected here so we have children located underneath. If I'd have selected something else, um, let's say for example board governors or members, they appear here, suppliers, inquirers, more, more of these options start appearing as you um, add these checkboxes. Now it may be that there are other groups of people who are not represented in these checkboxes. If that's the case, you just need to type them in here. You can type in any other um, term you want here. Um, oops, that was a typo. It doesn't matter. I, <laughs> I've demonstrated accidentally how you can do this. You can just um, remove any groups of people. 
So the obligation is to identify categories of data subjects. So that's true with PDPA as well as actually all of the laws. Um, you're not saying, not naming any people by name. Um, data subjects are is the legal term for people. So who are the people? We're identifying the categories of them. And like I said, we've got parents and we've got children. And then having identified the groups of people, we need to identify what personal data is being processed. The word process is a catch-all term in data protection. It just means use, store, handle, um, archive, um, et cetera. Process just means doing something with personal data. So in other words, what personal data is involved in this process. So for parents and legal guardians, we can click on the drop down here and select the things that are involved. Um, so we've got first name, last name and address, and it may be that you need to make changes here as well. Perhaps you take the parent's contact number and email address as part of the withdrawal process. So whatever it is, you can uh, select it and you can also type in additional items here um, and include them here. There are unlimited numbers of additional um, data types that you can add in here. When you're happy with your selections, you click apply, and then you can do the same with children. And once again, there may be things here that you need to uh, change as well. We have academic records or, or education. We might have first name, last name. There may be other things that are being recorded as well. So whatever it is, once again, just click apply on here and you'll have, you'll have identified the appropriate data types. So we are already meeting quite a lot of the requirements for record of processing. Um, they, are, they require you to, to state what you're using personal data for, who the data subjects are, what kind of personal data is being processed. Um, and so, so hopefully that was that you're seeing that as a fairly quick and easy step. Now let's go on a bit more. Um, lawful basis processing, this sometimes is a little challenging to understand. Mark did explain the lawful basis in his part of the presentation. Um, we spend time helping our schools to understand these. So if you struggle, um, don't be afraid to ask, we have help videos as well. But just to explain this, laws such as PDPA, GDPR, others including the draft China law and Brazil and so on, require you to specify what is the lawful basis for processing data. So you're gonna use someone's personal data, you're gonna collect it, you're gonna store it, you're gonna do something with it. You must have a justification for it, a legal justification for it. And there are various options for this. Sometimes it's about asking for their consent. That can be the reason, that can be your justification. Usually for a school, it's actually the second one down. Processing is necessary to enter into or for the performance of a contract to which the data subject is party. In plain English, this means that it's part of a contract. You're processing this data as part of a contract. And indeed, for a school, you sign a con you know, parents sign a contract with the school to educate their children. That is the contract. And that underpins a lot of the reasons why you need to then process the data of the children or the parent. So this is a primary one um, for, for uh, many activities. There are other ones as well. Well, there may be a legal obligation um, and that requires you to do something or you may have a legitimate interest a fair and reasonable um, reason to to process the data in your school in this case contract is the appropriate one to go with and then in our pre-selected template there's also um, suggested wording for the evidence for selected lawful basis you need to explain why um, or where your your legal justification is founded. In this case, as I mentioned, there is a school um, parent contract in place. So that's why we have this here. Special category data refers to data that is particularly sensitive. It typically refers to things like health data, um, but it can also include things like fingerprint, facial recognitions, uh, biometric data. It can include things like criminal records data in Thailand. So um, Thailand has similar categories to Europe. In, in this sense, although in Thailand, it's in, at least in translation, it's called sensitive data rather than special category data. In this case, there aren't any special category data as part of the withdrawal process, but if you were doing anything to do with medical safeguarding welfare or criminal records, if you were in, in the recruitment process, then yes, would be selected. Next, list any third parties used in this processing activity. Here it's important to understand who your data processors are, who your vendors are, who your, who other, what other organizations are involved in processing. And if you're using a system like Veracross, for example, you would type that in and make sure that they are identified here. Next is the retention period. 
perhaps you have an identified retention period for your school, you should do it's part of the requirements again under, under PDPA that you know how long your data is being stored. You cannot just keep data indefinitely. Um, the principle is that you keep data only for as long as you need it. So you, every organization needs to decide for all of its data, how long do we need to keep this data? Um, and this is where you would identify that. Finally, the last bit on here, location where the processing activity is communicated. In other words, where is your privacy notice? Um, there must be some kind of information um, uh, that's, that's provided to people in order to, so that they know uh, what personal data you're gathering and why you're gathering it, um, et cetera. So there should be some kind of privacy notice that accompanies this. Um, and it's another thing that we work with schools very closely on. Some of the templates um, that Mark showed you in his section actually cover things like privacy notices. We have draft template privacy notices that we can provide for you and we will work with you to make sure that they are updated and, and, uh, and appropriate. And it's the sort of thing you might have on your website or you might distribute them with admissions. And in this case, it would probably be wise to distribute it with a withdrawal form as well so that people understand how their data is being used and what the purposes are for. Those privacy notices must also be written in clear and plain language. So this is an opportunity for you to, to recognize and identify and record that your, your communication uh, to data subjects is, is fair, reasonable, and clear and transparent. So with that, we finish page one. That's, as I said, a whistle-stop tour. I would spend more time on this normally when we do the training session, but hopefully that was clear enough. We're going to proceed to pages two and then three before we wrap up this demonstration. Page two starts thinking about um, risk now. And as we mentioned before, in the PDPA, there is an expectation to understand the risk of a situation because how you, how you process and handle your data in situations such as data breaches and subject access requests and so forth um, are, are risk dependent. That's very normal among data protection laws around the world. They are risk-based. So you need to understand um, in detail how you're processing data. And here are a selection of items that, that, are, that are understood generally across data protection across the world as, as sometimes needing further consideration. Um, some of these are quite simple to understand. Vulnerable data subjects include children. So schools will be selecting this very frequently. Um, in addition to that, in Thailand, as indeed lots of other um, nations, there is a need to understand if data is leaving the country. In this case, if you were using something like Veracross, those servers are outside Thailand. You are actually, when you enter data into Veracross, sending data outside the country. So this may be occurring as well. And if you were, for example, taking health data, medical data, safeguarding data, or anything like that, you might want to select this one too. There are other options on here. We do explain them on pop-ups, and I would explain them if this was a training exercise, but um, in the interest of time, I won't cover these for now. The purpose of this is to help you understand what's going on. And very often when you do a record of processing, you won't know the answer to these questions. So it's a prompt to go and find out more, and that will help you understand if you need to do a DPIA. A DPIA is a data protection impact assessment. It's a risk assessment. It's a further evaluation of the risks associated with the processing. Um, and it's very good practice to make sure that you, you do these um, in all instances where there might be a concern about the, the type, quantity, or um, methods of processing. So once you're happy with the screen and you reviewed this and you considered it carefully, click on save and next. And that brings us to the final screen where you must enter in a, an appropriate reviewer. So you are putting whoever is required to review this and they have an opportunity to look at it and perhaps when they're happy, they can confirm they've reviewed it. The system will prompt for a review date at some later time. It is a year in advance because best practice for records of processing is they should be reviewed at least once a year. So these are living documents. With that, I'm gonna click save and exit. We have completed a processing activity record for student withdrawal. And you'll see when I click save and exit, that it appears here in our main page along with the other records. So that's how you would go through this. You will carry on perhaps using the quick start templates initially, but as you start doing that, you'll think of new processes, your data owners, your colleagues will uh, hopefully inform you about anything else that's going on in their departments and you can create a new process to explain and describe those. Thanks, Andrew. The, the, the question I had, if I, if I get stuck, because there's quite a lot of terminology there. Yeah. Where can I go to get to sort of understand what the you know, what each of these terms means, or if I have to introduce someone else to the concept of a 
data controller, where would I find that information? Yeah, we do a lot to try and help people with this. So initially every school is assigned a consultant, someone like me to work with them. So we're on hand to answer those questions. In addition, there is self-help available as well. Within each of those forms, in every place where there's any kind of difficulty, we have a little tooltip pop up. You can hover your mouse over there and we define it. We also have a help section on the left hand side here where there are lots of videos. Now, the, these relate to different parts of our app. The one that you would look at in this context is data privacy and protection. And here we have lots of things where we explain what they are. You see how these videos are, are not too long, they're just quite short, and they just tell you how you go about uh, doing anything. So we have a lot of help available. Don't be afraid to ask. And also, I would say, don't be afraid to leave entries blank. Um, very few of those fields are mandatory fields. You can leave them blank and come back later. Um, and you know, carry on, enter as much information as you can, and don't be afraid to ask. We are here to help you, um, so you can request support anytime you need. One of the reasons why we, so everyone knows, one of the reasons why we created the app um, is that we, before this, we had a spreadsheet toolkit, and some of you would have seen this when I was training in Thailand, in Thailand the Bangkok Prep last, last year, and the toolkit was just, you know, it was just spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet because you don't you're not only just capturing what you do you then need to manage what you do so the, the whole idea with the app is it's a, it's a low cost a low point of entry um for schools to get the expertise that they need in in privacy and be able to manage their compliance program and also also have that automated so we've built automation into the heart of it and some of the things that andrew have shown you shown you there in terms of the, the dates that then get, gets aggregated into an overall calendar that then will start um, notifying people. So you've got a little bell, I won't go on now, a little bell and like a little Facebook bell in the corner, that's notifications. But if you are the, um, the head of admissions, for example, it will notify you when you have to do certain things. Um, and it also has a task management feature, which is all about project management, allows you to manage all your tasks and, 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 and incident management is around managing your, your cyber instance. And there, there, are, there are a lot more advanced features that are coming that, for example, will automate the building of your retention schedule. I know, Rick, you've asked that there. Um, so, so it will allow you to build your retention schedule and then you can build your policy off the back of your, off the back of your schedule. There was another question to say that, um, can you export data from your app? Yeah, so there's a legal requirement that you as an organization need, need to be able to um, uh, export the export the data. Currently, you would be you'd be exporting in a CSV, um, but as part of our development pipeline, um, you'll be able to download it into you know, a PDF for that, that 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 may be easier and more and more and more presentable um, for you. Um, Chris asked the following: Is the expectation that the kind that, that the kind of record is in the app made for every student leaving? No, no. What what, what we're saying is that uh, that that withdrawal is just a processing activity that affects many different students but there's a common data set affecting that process so what you will find as you get into record of processing is that you're doing business analysis on how your organization operates you'll look at how the information and data flows go goes goes through the organization and through the departments um, and many schools have taken the opportunity to then start creating efficiencies in terms of how they do things, because essentially you have to lift them, lift up the carpet, and look at look at everything. So, um, if there are things in your school that you have wanted to do for many years, bring in different IT systems, create efficiencies between departments, then that, the PDPA actually yeah, gives you a, a very good opportunity to do that and streamline things. So, um, Andrew, I really appreciate that. Um, what I'm going to do is going to share my screen again. If I just say that, out, I'm going to introduce. Rob, so many of you should be familiar with Rob. Um, make sure that all that looks that looks good. Um, uh, the um, uh, yeah, Bradley said, "Is your spreadsheet toolkit available?" Uh, unfortunately, Brad, that is part of a uh, a payful service, um, so it's not something that we can give up for free. Unfortunately, there's a lot of the, the thousands of hours have got into that, and thousands of hours have then got into the um, got into the. Uh, um, gone into the app and believe me, you don't want to be using it. It's 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 um, very difficult. Um, so where was I? No, questions. I think I was. Yeah, where was I? Okay, let's go straight into the questions now with Rob. <laughs> so hi, Rob. Thanks for joining us. Um, now, obviously, you, you've seen that all the things that we that we're doing, and you know, as an Andrews, you you guys are quite advanced in in your program. 
what's been your greatest challenge with um with with, with compliance with the pdpa so our biggest challenge is probably um putting sufficient measures in for training so um you know people talk about kind of you know getting to compliance and pdpa gdpr but actually it's about educating staff so we put so many different programs together to work with you know people from guards and gardeners up to kind of senior management and I think that's been really, really challenging because you have to um, get everybody on board with this because it affects everybody in the school because we're not just employees, we're data subjects ourselves, many of us have children in the school. So that's probably our biggest challenge, but it, it has gone very, very well, but a lot of planning has gone into that. Yeah, and how did you, because there are many people on this call that are essentially in your shoes, but in their school, how did you get you know, to the point where you understand the PDPA to the depth that you do? Um, so I, I come from a data security background, but obviously I'm relatively new to, to compliance. Um, so I've worked with a lot of consultants kind of along the way, and we, we do have compliance in London, but you need to go through the PDPA and actually understand what they're asking here. And you need to look at the key terminology here, you know, we're talking about data controllers and data processors. And you do need to understand kind of as an organization what that means. And what you have to put in place and i know that for many they think it is a really really scary journey to begin but the most important part is beginning and once you start everything will become so much clearer and and with that how much time did st angie's give you to do and also you've got the, you've got your natural interest in data security and compliance how much time does this st angie's give you to sort of get to grips with sort of the P, the pdpa as it, as it stands so um, for me, like when I, when I speak at the ISAC conference too, so this is a full-time job. I mean, I, I teach a little bit. Most of my job is about uh, our compliance journey. So this is, this is a full-time role. And it's not just obviously me doing this role. This is very much project managing. I've got, uh, I've got a team of 15 plus admin managers, obviously sitting down with them, explaining what's required within departments and implementing change. And that's a, that's a big task. This is leading with the academic and admin side of the school. So, so there's so many people involved in this. It's not just a, it's not just a single person, but plus obviously we have a legal town, uh, a legal uh, firm um, which work with us as well. Yeah. And obviously we need them to obviously approve data retention, um, approve different policies we are implementing because we do need to make sure that all of our legal bases uh, are covered. Okay, and how would you, because also sort of the feedback that we've had in terms of speed to lots of schools is, they are there's a, there's a challenge in getting the sort of the school admin or the administrators or the owners or the leadership to sort of understand the sort of the the breadth the depth the scope the the need for resources to be you know to be pdpa compliant or the start of the compliance journey what what messages would you advise that they should be providing to those 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 individuals that are running the school and making the decisions after the resources um it is really really difficult because not all school leadership will have um you know have the same understanding of kind of compliance but the biggest the biggest point that i've made to them is it, it isn't you know about this tick box exercise it's actually about the cultural change and it's helping them to understand why there's such a meaningful change in in data and when they do understand that they will quickly obviously uh, be on board and when you start talking about if you are compliant this obviously speaks uh, volumes about the integrity of the school yeah. And integrity is also, you know, we're all fee paying, paying schools, right? So where parents see that, you know, schools have real integrity and they take compliance seriously, it's a big selling point. It's a huge marketing point. And, you know, St. Andrews are obviously marketing this. Uh, my talk at ISAT as well is obviously their advantage. And I think that um, that's another good way to get senior leadership on board. Correct. And what, where would you say, as a, the last question before, but then we've uh, got, got, got some questions on the, um, on the chat. Um, where would you say like you know, your colleagues should start? Is it reading the PDPA? Is it you know, what is it? What's the you know, if they what's their key takeaway from today from, from you? Okay, um, so two big things. So I mean, uh, other, other schools have asked this question. So uh, number one, um, understand what's required for data mapping. You need to be able to account for your data. Number two, you need to set up a data retention policy. So if you you need to consider the laws in Thailand, so you do need a legal team to work with you. So those two points there, set up your data retention policy, get it, you know, um, legalized, make sure the lawyers uh, sign it off and mapping as well. 
those yeah. two points. I think. Brilliant, brilliant. Cheers, Rob. So to give you some of the questions um, that we've got here, can we link our policies from Google Drive to the app, or do we need to upload PDF files? Um, prefer to keep live documents linked in case there are changes. You, 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 there are ways you can link um, link your Google your Google Drive documents, and um, there will be a repository within the app where you can store your 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 PDF versions. So you know you need to maintain your version control. So every version that you have, you would then you would then um, you would then um, upload it. Um, Kevin then asked. Uh, when our data control is required to be compliant, what are the time frames of defining and putting the processes in place? Okay, so this this comes back to a different question also around. Uh, there's a different question on here as well, which is quite quite interesting, um, which was about basically if you buy the nine app, are you compliant? A nine. Um, okay, what are, what are we subscribing to, Eden? What are we subscribing to with nine? Can nine guarantee that the school is fully compliant, or the schools need to dig in the information themselves through the nine app? Compliance is all about your understanding of risk. So compliance is you understanding the data that you collect and you process within your school and you do that through your record of processing. And as a data mapping exercise that sits behind that um, and that's what Andrew's just shown. For each of those processing activities, um, you are evaluating the risks associated with what's called the rights and freedoms of the data subjects being the staff, students and, and, and families. And then, and then your compliance is actually how you measure and how you manage those risks. So, for example, um, and that and that's depending on the demographic and the data that's shared. So, for example, Rob and and St Andrews may may have uh, a low appetite for risk, and consequently, they are applying more resources in terms of Rob's time, money with money lawyers to manage their risks and to reduce their risks. And that's because they've decided that they have a low risk appetite. Um, your school needs to determine where its risk appetite sits, whether it's low, medium and high, and apply a proportionate level of resources in terms of people's time, um, money, um, uh, you know, apps, um, consultancy, to reduce those risks. And it needs to evidence those decisions in an objective format. By doing that, that is being compliant. You can you can stand by the decisions and the judgments that your school has made, and you've done it in an, in, a, in, a, in an objective way. And objectivity is not just a single person doing it. What our app allows you to do is to build a framework of how you have you have captured all your processing activities by department. It allows you to capture your risks, it allows you to evaluate and measure your risks, and then it allows you to allocate individuals to to lower your lower your risks. Um, it allows you to capture training records of staff. It allows you to create the hierarchy of responsibility. So it allows you to build the objectivity in terms of how you're moving your compliance framework forward. So whilst the app does not you know, tick, it's not a tick box tick box tick box exercise. It allows you to build that framework, and then we can support you in making objective decisions in terms of what actions you should take. So with Roberts and Andrews. They've made this, a decision to do a cyber vulnerability assessment with nine because they feel that cyber risk is a great concern and one of the highest priorities at the moment. I would arguably agree with Rob to say that currently cyber the cyber risk is the biggest risk um, uh, associated with all process act processing activities in, in every single school. So as part of your compliance plan for the next six to 12 months, you'd be at what point are we going to do a cyber vulnerability assessment? Because that is the biggest risk to you having a security incident and a, and, a, and a significant breach that would lead you to reporting yourselves to the supervisory authorities. Um, I was going to wrap up a few more questions um, in terms of the support that we provide. So ISAT have been, uh, been pretty brutal in terms of making sure that we provide um, a cost effective solution to all scores, no matter what the resource is, from the smallest kindergarten to, to the largest schools. Um, we have the app which you can buy. We have an app and there's a training program. So there's a, an eight or 12 week training program that um, is very, very low cost, starts in April, but we need people to be to subscribe by the end of March. And we need a minimum of eight schools to make it cost effective. But essentially week in, week out, we take you through the framework. We tell you what you need to do in a group of other schools. Uh, you have homework to do each week and that allows you to, to evidence your compliance program. But then we have more in-depth services that many schools in Thailand take where we have a consultancy-led program like where, where, where Andrew will lead you through 
every year all your compliance tasks and take and take you through what you need to do, review your risks and provide you with um, with, with, with analysis. Um, for ISAT, we have provided a, a nine relationship management. So Suktika will be will be re, will be reaching out. Um, and um, and obviously you've seen you've seen the you've seen the nine app, um, but I'll go back to my message earlier on. The nine app brings with it an enhanced amount of hours that no other school in no other country gets to support them with their compliance program, which ISAT have negotiated. If all 160 schools in ISAT took that in the end of March, there's no there's no way we could we have the cap the resource to do that. So it's on a first come first serve basis. And depending on when you sign up to nine, will be where you form as part of the queue in terms of working with our working with our services. And unfortunately, that's an economic reality that we just don't have people sitting around. But what we will do is we will do the best by you and ensure that you need to know everything to to be compliant. And we have a whole team not only within the UK but in also in, in India and in North America that are standing here to to back you and support you in terms of moving your compliance forward. And protect your staff, um, uh, your staff and students. One last thing I'll say um, before we wrap up is that in the next um, in the next uh, twelve months, there will be a child protection and safeguarding version of the app um, that will be launched in partnership with the Council of International Schools. So, if you are a CIS accredited school, you're the, there is essentially. Uh, a free version or, or, or on how to manage safeguarding uh, compliance within your school um, that, that that is coming up. So by using our app, if you're a CRS school, um, that will uh, will provide you the foundations for that when it comes out um, early early next year. With that, um, one last question from Kevin. Um, uh, so would penalties for non-compliance only be applied for when something goes wrong? Penalties generally are applied where 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 you are being negligent of your duties, and negligent is very simple. You have not done a data map to understand what your record of processing is, because you and consequently means you haven't better evaluate the risks of your processing activities, which means you can't manage those risks and you can't develop policies and procedures to 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 um, to govern those risks within the school. You have not trained your staff. In the risks that are actually real to you, because you've done your record of processing, and 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 it's organisations where those things happen are the ones that will get fined, not the ones. So it's like it's like the the way I sort of explain it was when I was at school, when when you was doing when I was doing my maths GCSEs, which I was pretty bad at. It wasn't wasn't necessarily the answer that you got at the end. So you do the equation and you got an answer. You wouldn't get necessarily the mark for the answer. You get the marking for the working out that you went through. And the same is to be said with privacy. Um, it's how, it's the journey that you've taken and how you've documented that journey. So, if your school does nothing between now and and June, and then it's hit by a significant cyber attack in July, and then it reports itself to the supervisory authorities in PDPA, uh, and it gets investigated, I would expect some form of action, um, uh, some sort of fine or or other contingent action in Thailand, because you would probably be deemed to be willfully negligent given at the moment. Um, 60, as reported by Microsoft, 63% of total malware encounters are targeting education. So we know it's a, a high risk area. With that, I would like to thank um, Rob. I'd like to thank Andrew. Um, next week also we have uh, Vaughan from NIST joining us for some Q&A. Um, and if you have any questions in the meantime, um, reach out to the Nine team. Um, they'll be sending a copy of this presentation. The webinar is available on demand. And also, if there's other areas that you want us to cover off, um, then let us know because we can always put on a different webinar, uh, add it onto the end, or, or incorporate it into this webinar. So, um, thank you very, very much for your time, and um, yeah, look forward to you next week. And um, thanks again. Bye.